and I knew there was one other important thing I wanted to tell you this morning. Today is a special day in the world. Today is Fred Hearn's 90th birthday. I can't believe Fred is 90 years old when I see the energy and the vitality that he has, but I'm glad that God has blessed us with his life for 90 years. Happy birthday, Fred. Join me now in the call to worship. Be present with us this day, O God. Be present with us this day, O God. Be present with us this day, O God. Amen. The hymn is number 382, Be Thou My Vision. Hymn number 382. me now in the invocation as we pray together. O oh God, we pray for eyes to see the world as you see the world. O oh God, we pray for hearts to love the world as you love the world. O oh God, we pray for hands to serve the world in your name as you have created and called us to do. These things we pray in the name of our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
<clears throat> Beloved, as we seek to become what God would have us to be, God is patient with our growth. Thanks be to God. Responsive reading today is based on Psalm 119, verses 105 through 112. Your word is a lamp to my feet. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it in my heart. I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord. Accept my offerings of praise, O Lord. I hold my life in my hand continually. The wicked have laid a snare for me. Your decrees are my heritage forever. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever. <coughs> Amen. Our hymn is number 272, Thy Word. It's a brief little hymn, so you may want to go ahead and stand because Sandy says we're going to start a lot quicker than we usually start. Uh, and the words are fairly simple, but we sing together hymn number 272, Thy Word. so that we can see you. Uh, we think it's important that we know who you are because we believe that you are as much a part of their growing up as anyone else. Uh, in fact, we know that it takes a village to raise a child and we're grateful for your participation and your willingness to be here and celebrate on this day with them. You may be seated. These are the waters of baptism and today these waters welcome these children into the community of faith as a part of the family of God. 
Baptism is that thing that unites one's life with God, with Christ Jesus, and with the community of faith that we call the church. Let me ask you parents now if you will read with me the pledge that we ask of you to make to your children on this day of baptism. We promise to remind our loved one of this day. We promise to teach them the importance of faith and to connect them to this community of faith inasmuch as it depends on us. Let me invite our church members to stand now and offer your promise to this family. As a church, we promise to provide for these precious ones a safe haven to explore faith, to encounter God, and to learn the importance and value of community. You may be seated. And now, Hudson, because of your faith and the faith of your family, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And Georgia, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. May this beginning of your journey of faith grow and prosper as you do. May you learn the goodness of God. May the goodness of God fill each of your lives and flow from your lives as you go through life. May the blessing of God be upon you always.
ladies that's one of my favorites we headed over into Pennsylvania yesterday and Shannon was practicing in the car there must be about 45 different versions of that song and my iPod has at least 43 of them on it so one of my there you go our reading this morning comes from the earliest history of the church from Acts chapter 10 verses 9 through 15 about noon the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the heaven open and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. Then he heard a voice saying, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. The voice said to him again a second time, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. This is the word of the Lord. It is such a joy to be here, especially to witness the baptism of Hudson and Georgia Coverdale. I do need to tell the Coverdale family that you got it easy. I was at a Russian Orthodox baptism not long ago. The, uh, the baptistry itself looked like a, a liturgical equivalent of a 55-gallon drum tipped on end and filled to the brim with water. And the priest had all of the family gather in a circle around the baptistry and then proceeded to strip the child to its birthday suit and then to plunge the child into the water, not once but three times for each person of the Trinity. And by the time he got done, the family looked like they had been baptized as well. You had it easy. <laughs> I bring you greetings from the, your sister churches and congregations of the International Council of Community Churches. Uh, you've heard that we're meeting in annual conference. Uh, we, will have, uh, we will have a Bible study led by the Reverend Dr. I just went blank on his name. Tony Campolo. Tony Campolo. <laughs> Uh, and we will have, we will have uh, highly intense workshops, but I do have to tell you that the real reason why we get together is it's a family reunion, and we, we, uh, we see our friends there, uh, who we've, uh, some of us have uh, met years ago. It, it's sort of like uh, Sunday worship at a church gone large, uh, you know, uh, you all pretend to the preacher that the only reason that you're here is because you're so highly pious, but I know better. Uh, you're, you know, it's the fellowship, it's the connection, it's the service, it's everything that, that is a church. So at any, at any rate, it's, it's great to be here 
representing them. The voice said to him again a second time, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. Let us pray. In our songs, in our prayers, in our speaking, and in our silence, whisper to us, Holy Spirit, in the Christ. Amen. The scripture reading describes a very strange vision, but for those of us who are from Maine, it is one of the most important parts of the Bible. Because Peter was being directed to eat non-kosher food. And when you think about it, there is nothing more non-kosher than a lobster from Maine. <laughs> and what's good enough for the Apostle Peter is good enough for us, so bring on a lobster. <laughs> that, by the way, is called Ashmolean Biblical Exegesis. <laughs> the Apostle Peter grew up just as we have in a society that, that built and that builds all kinds of walls. I mean, you know, in our society there are people who are computer gurus and there are people who can't even find the on-off switch on the tower of the, of the computer. There are people who barely made it through high school and there are people with advanced degrees. There are people who are competent in several languages and there are people like me who are barely coherent in English. And the boundaries, the walls between those groups are defined and refined every day to the advantage of some and the disadvantage of others. And there's nothing new in that. In Peter's day, there were people who knew the ins and outs of what was kosher and what was treff, that's non-kosher, and there were those who just sort of went along and tried to do the best they could. There were people who knew their politics in dealing with the Roman Empire and who could make their way up the social ladder because of it and there were others who didn't quite know how to do it and got themselves in deep trouble. So in the vision this huge sheet descends out of the heavens and it is filled with all kinds of knowledge or lack of knowledge and God blesses all of it? Does that mean that when I go to a high-class, classy restaurant and I'm sitting there at the table waiting for a dignified waiter to come up and deal with me, somebody comes slouching up and says, what can I do for you guys? Is that suddenly also kosher? Of course, the walls were not and are not all about knowledge. Peter lived at the eastern end of the Roman Empire. And that meant that the imperial boundary was not all that far away. And there were people on the other side of that boundary. And they had traditions and beliefs that were different. And those folk who lived near the boundary had long memories and they remembered when the boundaries had been invaded they remembered as Jews having been in exile in Babylon. And there they were, just the other side of the border. What if they came across again? The legions of the Roman Empire stood between civilization as Peter knew it and the unknown. And the unknown is always frightening and scary. And then even within the empire, there were those strange people, all kinds of strange people. If you were ever in church on Pentecost, they always read the section from Acts 2 in which the people hearing each one of them, the gospel being preached in their own tongue by some miraculous means, say, wait a minute, some of us are Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Cappadocia and Pamphylia and all the rest of those things. The poor people who have to read those scriptures on Pentecost Sunday always mess that, you know. 
And as far as Peter was concerned, they were weird. They were strangers. They were different. They were somehow distasteful. Need I draw the modern parallel to that? I live in down east Maine, way up towards the Canadian border. And in that part of Maine, the locals have a name for the section of Maine that is south of Portland, the big city. They call it <coughs> Northern Massachusetts. <laughs> uh, well, except for the Boston Red Sox, that, that's an exception. <laughs> They're from a way, they're different. And so a huge sheet descends out of the heavens and it's filled with folk who look different and dress different and act different and live different and we are the insiders or thought we were and we thought they were the outsiders and suddenly they're all kosher? Surely, Lord, you don't mean, then fill out, fill out the rest of that sentence with the group that you're thinking about. You mean they're kosher too? When I was growing up, I went to an American Baptist church in the north end of Yonkers, New York. And uh, there the enclave was um, middle class and lily white. When we sang a hymn on Sunday morning and it was in 4-4 four, four rhythm, when by the time we got done singing it, it sounded like a march, you know, the heavy one, two, three, four. And, you know, we did an hour of that and then everybody went home. And for most people in the congregation, that was the end of church for the week, but not for us, not for my family. My dad had been... Uh, he had been licensed as a lay preacher by the church and by the denomination. And somehow during my childhood, for 13 years, he secured the Sunday evening preaching appointment at another church. It was the Matthew 1128 Gospel Mission Church on West 165th Street on the island of Manhattan in the heart of Harlem. And I gotta tell you, when they sang a hymn and it was in 4-4 four, four rhythm, the heavy beat was on 2 and 4, syncopated. And then we were done with that and you would have thought that that was enough religion for me for one week, but oh no. You see, the Yonkers school system at the time had this deal. You could get out of going to to school for one hour at the end of the day on Wednesday, but you had to go some, to some kind of religious instruction. And the only available Protestant religious instruction in the area was offered by an Episcopal church. And it was High Church Episcopal Church. And the rector was into Gregorian chants which doesn't have a rhythm. <laughs> well, not the way we sang it anyway. Talk about walls. I was a kid, and, and so I'm, I noticed the difference in the music. If the Episcopal, never mind the rest of the differences, if the Episcopal Church choir had appeared at the Matthew 11:28 church, they wouldn't have understood what was going on. And if either of the other choirs had shown up on Sunday morning at my church, they would have been confused. If you want to talk about waltz, if you want to talk about snobbery, just talk with people about music. Those of us who are into classical music know that it is, and therefore we are, a little bit superior. <laughs> and as for R&B lovers, they think country western is crude. <laughs> and folk music folk know that they're on the right track and everybody else is phony and pretentious. 
And suddenly there's this great big sheet coming down out of the heavens. And both Presley and Paganini are both in it. Of course, my childhood responses to the music were naive. And you and I both know it. Music was the least of the differences between those churches. In American society, anybody who was older and just a little bit wiser would have spotted immediately race and money and social class and style and all of the other markers that cause us to raise walls between human beings. Only a child would have been so unaware. Dare we imagine a huge sheet coming down out of heaven, spread out like a blanket, and there are red and yellow and black and white and all of the other skin tones in between, and they're all there and they're all kosher. Dare we imagine no money at all and riches so great that they couldn't be spent in three generations and Wall Street and a Harlem street corner all there and all kosher for all of us. And that, that of course, was what Jesus was talking about in his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane when he asked that all of his followers might be one, which meant that all would be reconciled, and all the divisions overcome, and all the walls of separation torn down. In our dreams about an ideal Christianity and an ideal world, that's what we'd like to think about. But you and I know that between where we are and where that is, it's a long way. And you know, we in the church, we start talking about this sort of thing and, and we get, oh, we get flowery and we use the fancy language and you know, all of that kind of stuff. About 10 years ago, the Roman Catholics and the, and the Lutherans had a big conference between theologians. And they, they announced, after they were all done, that there really wasn't any difference between the positions of the two communions when it came to the doctrines of justification and sanctification. Big words. They were the fighting words of the Reformation. Wait a minute. You guys are now saying it was all a mistake? Oops. And you tore down and burned down Europe for a hundred years? And you burn people at the stake? Oops doesn't quite do it. You need to move beyond the theo theological stuff and spend at least as much time dealing with all of the history of pain and hatred and destruction and terror and only then can you begin to talk about true reconciliation. Glossing over a history of violence and hatred and oppression isn't just a failing of theologians. You and I, you and I, not theologians, you and I have serious work to do before that rhetoric of reconciliation can become reality in our society. If we ignore the pains of the past, we won't ever get to where we'd like to be. There's a huge sheet descending out of the heavens for all of us in this society, and it is filled with things we'd rather not see, but they're there. So anyway, Peter wakes up from his vision. And by the way, uh, this part is not in the Bible reading that you heard today. So you have to get out your Bible and read the next few verses, okay? So Peter wakes up, and the vision turns into reality. And he's confronted with the worst of the worst. There's a man at the door, and he's a centurion, which means he's a Roman soldier, which means in order to get his rank, he had to sacrifice to the emperor. He's a pagan of the worst sort. He's a Gentile. He's a foreigner. He is everything that is not kosher in Peter's world. And now Peter, the observant Jew, has to make a decision. What about all those walls that separate him from Cornelius? 
according to what he's been told since childhood, that person is on the outside. So what does he do? Well, if you've ever read anything in the New Testament, you know that Peter's response to everything is to make speeches. I mean, you know, it's just... Every time, every time you look and Peter's name is mentioned, he's blabbering out something. Except this time. This time, he just welcomes him and gives him hospitality. Every wall has crumbled. Every boundary has been erased. Every obstacle has been dissolved which may apply to us as church and churches you know we in church we like to talk 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 everything to death we preach without ending which it won't be true this morning i hope we just go on and we tend to forget that when when jesus <coughs> indicated how you get into the kingdom and who's in the kingdom and who isn't and jesus only mentioned this once Jesus didn't talk about talking. Jesus said, I was hungry, and you fed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Not much speech-making, resolution passing there. So I would like to suggest to you today that it's time to talk stop talking and instead to take action we've seen the vision we know that what we thought was traff is now kosher so what are we going to do about it i have to tell you that i don't know what you're going to have to do about it i can only tell them what i'm going to do about it and it may be that what you do about it will have to do with one person talking to another and listening to another. Or it may have to do with something between a congregation like this one and the town hall across the street. Or it may be on an even larger turf. Some of what needs to be done is going to be difficult because there is a history of pain. And yet it's past time to do something. We have no choice. We've been told it's time to tear down the walls of separation. And what will give us guidance in that is yet another vision from the scriptures. It comes from the last book of the Bible and it envisions a time at the end of time and beyond time when God's people are gathered for a victory banquet. And there's a huge table because there's room enough for all. Nobody has to sit out in the kitchen or at a side table. There's food enough for all. And all will be welcome and all will be filled. And there is a place of honor for all. For all are God's children. Those who have been disgraced will be honored. Those who have been left in want will receive a full measure packed down and overflowing and those who have been pushed aside will be embraced and included. And all will know that reconciling, unifying love that was the love of Jesus and is the love of God and will be forevermore the love of the Spirit. So if, if you go away from this day with anything, think about this. Your world is not limited to gefilte fish and bagels and being kosher. You can eat lobster. Thank you, Don. We're going to receive an offering now. May God bless the gifts you've brought to give this day. <laughs> 